This is our story during the Paleolithic, a time of adventure and imagination. I already introduced you to Lucy, the first Australopithecus we know of, a young girl under 20 years of age who was just over three feet tall and weighed under 60 pounds. She was found by an expedition almost 50 years ago, very close to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia in Africa. And they named her Lucy because they were just hearing this little song on the radio. They found half of her skeleton, 52 bones, with all her teeth, even wisdom teeth, but without the canyons of chimpanzees. We know that she walked on her feet because of the shape of her pelvis and her knees and because of her arched feet. But she spent a lot of time in the trees jumping from branch to branch because of the strength of her arms. And she probably died falling from a very high branch, over 40 feet high. The size of her skull is that of a chimpanzee with a brain of around 400 cubic centimeters, a third of yours. But the oldest footprints we keep predate Lucy. Almost four million years old, they belong to three Australopithecus, most likely two adults and a child, walking on a path over volcanic ash at Leitoli in Tanzania. It's the prehistory of man which lasts from 4 million years ago to 3000 BC. When we say that history begins, the moment we started writing. That is to say that we were illiterate for a very long line of time compared to the short while we've been writing. We were illiterate, but not stupid. And what defined us wasn't not knowing how to write, but being great explorers, adventurers and nomads. We lived in tribes or clans, mostly family, who tried to camp near rivers, lakes or any source of water. To protect themselves from the cold, rains, winds and hurricanes, they took refuge in caves and nooks until someone particularly skilled decided to experiment and began to make huts with sticks, logs, mud, bones, skins, whatever they found around. They stayed in one place until the resources were exhausted. Then they left to explore and settle elsewhere. They spent part of the day looking for water and food and getting to know the environment and local resources and spent all the spare time resting and sleeping. They ate mostly vegetables, getting to know plants really well. Their flowers, roots and leaves to avoid poisonous ones. They collected seeds, mushrooms, nuts, fruits of the forest and for animal protein, they ate bugs more than anything. Larvae, snails, cockroaches, ants, and all kinds of insects. Birds, reptiles, eggs, if they could steal them when mothers were looking somewhere else. Small mammals, squirrels, rabbits, foxes, and if there was a chance, they would get bigger pieces by stealing from scavengers or taking advantage of natural traps, such as cracks or muddy areas. But over time, they learned to work as a team and tried to hunt for themselves, planning strategies and setting own traps approaching against the wind and using claims, scented skins and even magic for good omens, although this was rather at the end of Paleolithic, the so-called upper. Depending on the region, they hunted bison, 
mammoths, the ancient elephants, deer, wolves, and even tigers and lions if they dared, woolly rhinos, bears. They used everything, not just the meat. They also drank their blood, ate the fat and bone marrow, and use their hooves, teeth, and horns as tools. And the skins, which they cleaned and polished to cover themselves and set up huts. In areas near rivers and seas, they worked out ways to get fish. By gaining in abilities, their brain grew too and we evolved into Homo habilis, the skilled one, about two and a half million years ago. Taller than Australopithecus, they measured more than four feet, and with a brain of up to 700 cubic centimeters, they ventured further and further, exploring all of Africa. The first habilis we heard of was a young man found by Mary and Louis Leakey in the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. That's why their tools, already quite improved, were called Olduvaiensis. 1.5 to 2 million years ago, Homo ergaster evolved, and soon after, Homo erectus, the upright man. The first one we met was a teenager, an almost complete skeleton found by Richard, son of the Lakeys, along with another expedition close to Lake Turkana in Kenya. The brain of the Erectus is already around 1,000 cubic centimeters and reaches our height between five and six feet. They created better tools and with the progressive lowering of the tongue, also a proto-language to communicate with other, beyond the gestures and sounds that monkeys already produce. Because they warn with different noises if an eagle flies by, a leopard comes walking, or a rival gang approaches. They watch the fire terrified when lightning lit a forest until someone very brave risked taking a burning stick as a mobile torch and kept it alive as a real treasure as they began to realize how useful fire was. It gave them light and heat. It scared away predators and allowed them to roast food and shake tools. No one exactly knows when someone noticed the sparks that flew when stones collided and must have tried really hard to produce heat, smoke and then fire by rubbing sticks and flint stones. Mastering fire was the most decisive tool of all evolution as it gave man so much power that made him king of the savanna. The Erectus spread throughout Asia in an evolution that was not linear because different places and climates were giving rise to different species. Some were isolated by deserts, glaciers and seas or because they were on islands, like the men of the Indonesian island of Flores, called hobbits for being a small species who were just over three feet tall. We also found remains of their tools and of a species of elephants that were just as small. They must have been Homo erectus that got there and survived until the Neolithic, contemporaries therefore of Homo sapiens, us. 400,000 years ago, Neanderthal man evolved specially adapted to the cold, he lived mainly in Asia and Europe. With better tools and more advanced hunting strategies, they ate mostly meat to get the more than 4,000 calories they needed 
and hence their broader thorax and bigger brain than ours, but less neuronal activity. They nursed their sick and buried their dead. Somewhat later, 250,000 years ago, Homo sapiens arose, the wise. When the weather got warmer, sapiens opened up new routes to Europe, where we call him Cro-Magnon man, and where he lived with the Neanderthals. But these were extinct, and thanks to a greater neural capacity, sapiens remained the only modern man, the man we are today. We populated the entire Earth when the ice melted and we made it to America through the Bering Strait. Throughout this evolution, they were acquiring lots of skills. They roasted meat and fish, making dishes richer and also more digestible and eliminating parasites and toxins. They learned to grind and knit legumes and wild cereals. As they went from one place to another, they hardly stored, except sometimes in snow, in salt, fat, animal juices, or drying food in the sun. They dominated the fire and carving over the years, sharpening sticks and stones they carved two-faced axes, increasingly effective flint knives, spears, harpoons, spades, and throwing weapons, javelins, assegais, shuttles, ball and wave thrusters, throwing arrowheads, even with fire and poison. They domesticated dogs that already at that time became great friends of man and helped him hunting. They carved toothpicks to clean teeth properly and they learned to sew with points of bone and wood with which they passed cords and strips through animal skins. They treated and polished skins to cover themselves. And that's how they invented clothes to protect themselves from the cold and from bugs too. And sometimes they used shoes made of fibers and skins. They also sewed ornaments, rings, necklaces, pendants made of spikes, teeth, shells and snails that were threaded with fibers. They were developing language as they needed precision to talk about things how to make tools, where to find food, water and animals, what happened yesterday or the plans for tomorrow. Their vocal cords were adapting and the tongue and neck bones going down, creating a basic language with vowels and consonants that over time they linked in phrases. Gossip was actually a very powerful spark for brain development and of course social too, talking about what wasn't in front of them, what they had seen and done, telling about others and starting to make up stories. Man, since he's a human being, develops the imagination and the emotions too. Joy until laughing out loud sadness until crying with tears, anxiety about the past and intrigue about the future are exclusively human. So are rituals and burials covering their dead with soil, logs and stones out of respect for their previous lives and to avoid seeing them rot and be eaten by scavengers they must have felt really small before the greatness of the forces around them. Eclipses, sunlight, the darkness of the night, 
lightning, thunder and hurricanes were forces with a life of their own, natural spirits that had to be respected and even satisfied with offerings to make them kind. To invoke these forces, beauty among them, rock art began. Spots and stripes first, and little by little, animals, bison, horses, bulls, lions, and then hunting scenes blurring the shadows to give them movement. They spread the colors on walls and high ceilings using tools and ladders too. They used their hands, bird feathers, brushes, charcoal, wood, stems and bones, often drawing in charcoal and then filling in with yellows and reds, mixing animal fat with blood, rust, clay, flowers, feces and urine. There are samples all over the world, some of them very well preserved in the dark depths of the caves. The oldest known is the Blombos Cave in South Africa, 73,000 years old, from the end of the Paleolithic, and these stripes are the oldest we know today. But the first discovery of rock art was made in Altamira, in Spain, in the 19th century. Bison, deer, symbols, engravings and pendants, and those of Chauvet and Lascaux in France stand out among many others. They also made engravings with barons or petroglyphs, reliefs carved with rocks on softer surfaces and then colored with pigments, just like tattoos are made and they began sculpture with female figurines or Venus in stone, ivory and bone with primitive chisels and animal figurines too and of course music We found whistles and bone flutes of that time that would accompany songs and percussion instruments in Spain, there are many remains of hominins, and in Acapuerca, in Burgos, are the oldest known European bones from 800,000 years ago and a mandible more than one million years old. They have called it Homo antecessor, with features of erectus and other species, and a brain of a thousand cubic centimeters. We believe they were cannibals, as we know for sure they were eaten by someone who attacked them. Atapuerca is the sample of a great cannibal feast. In the words of the paleontologist Juan Luis Arzuaga, they ate them whole and sucked their bones too. At the end of the Paleolithic, the so-called upper or superior, they ceased to be nomads and started to settle, forming stable towns where they began to dedicate themselves to being ranchers, farmers, artisans. They began to work. They are the first civilizations and we call that time Neolithic.